to try to explain today is to a very, very extremely general audience. So let me make sure I'm conserving or how I'm caught or what. It's really, it's, uh, I, I'll try to say all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, again, it's a very popular talk mm -hmm. that I give now. I'm trying to, to explain uh, really why even consider this non commutative geometry, what this is. And uh, and how it connects to mathematics to things. And really, the specific formalism is less important than the general thought here, the general uh, circle of ideas. And you can choose specific formalisms to try to work. So, I started in 1637. Uh, So in 1637, <laughs> what is it? Newton? Descartes. Uh, 1637, Descartes has this uh, very interesting intimation that there's these two very different things. One is represented by Euclid, while this is Descartes, 1967, and this is the uh, uh, well, famous book, Discourse of the Method, uh, uh, that Descartes publishes. And uh, I think he realizes, Descartes realizes here that there is these two very different. Uh, uh, ways to see, to think about mathematical questions. Here the main name is on the one kind is Euclid, and on the other hand is uh, Descartes. Uh, so they, they have developed all this uh, typographic language game called algebra, where they move these letters and they get answers to questions like if either has cut twice as many goals as John and all this kind of thing. While Euclid has developed this method of deduction uh, uh, that is opposite to the method of induction. Uh, all the axioms and lemmas and all the things that we still use to prove things. And then in this monumental work in 1960, very short, uh, because it was really the, the discourse of the method, his objective was entirely different. It's just in an appendix of this book called La Geometry. It's an appendix. Uh, so it's. Uh, It's just in this appendix of the book that uh, he does the, the first grand unification of mathematics between the Euclidean edifice of productive of the deductive method and the very pragmatic uh, language games, the symbolic typographic language games of the Persian civilization. It's very non-obvious that these two things can be unified. And it's a card in this small appendix to his book. Uh, the, and his only mathematical work, really, but absolutely fundamental, uh, that uh, the two are unified into what now we call the algebraic geometry. Or the, the, so it's the origin of the algebraic geometry. And so it's for the eras, this work, since 1937. Uh, Again, very short, only mathematical work of the character he really had more important fish to cross with mathematics with all these fundamental contributions. Uh, so, so I taught the conic sections. So, huh? so I taught the, the conic sections of the origin of algebra and geo, which is like uh, well, they are here, they are here. They are here, but not in equations. That's the yeah, yeah. And and all and it is the card that one that realizes that one equation is all of them at the same time. 
But of course, these guys have developed the unbelievable tricks of completion of the square and whatnot, this highly Manobi theory. And he realizes that these guys were doing the same as this guy. This is a tremendous unification step uh, of which absolute genius. Again, very short work, only mathematical work of the kind. Thousand years, what is it? No, no. And, I, and as I say in my paper, this is this talk is based on a paper that I have. Uh, and as I say in, the, in my paper, it's not that this comes out of the blue. People have intimated this relation over and over and over and over. over. These guys have intimated. These guys have intimated that both had intuitions of the other side. But only the car realizes that really they distinctly writes it in all clarity. And finally, there for the consciousness of humanity. Now it's a thing. It's that thing. It's very clear. It's no longer this kind of vague intuitions that people cannot reduce. It is not like a uh, much deviation of the subject of the problem. Just let me ask this question: Why the larger part of the book led to this appendix? Like, what was the kind of point that you wanted to? It's a, it's a very interesting question for it's a very serious deviation. Yeah. It's, a very, it's a very interesting question for experts in philosophy. And we, but we can go that, into that over dinner. Okay. And I have my opinions. But it's a it's a very debate it's a very debated thing. What was the motivation to put this thing there? And some people believe that is to avoid censorship. Uh, and to shut off the mouth of possible critics, etc. Uh, it's a very interesting question. It is a very interesting in any case, uh, La Geometrie uh, has this ex completely expressedness of situation. And now, but of course, he, 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 didn't, uh, he was not very strict about this thing, but he was working over the field of the real numbers, although he was not very pleased about this act. But he was working over the field of the real numbers. So, more or less, you could say that the next step of that size this quantum size mathematical revolution does not occur until 1857. Well, at least that's what I say. <laughs> but really, in my opinion, the next time we have a quantum jump of this magnitude in, in, in mathematical, in the expansion of the mathematical imagination and expression is in a paper from 1857, this could be considered a paper, it's very short, it's just an opinion. But this could be 1637. Uh, now, in 1857, and 20 years to the date, 20 days to the date, uh, we have the, uh, uh, notice that the language of expression changes. And this is from 1857, the theory of pavilion functions, the Bernard Riemann. And this is the jump from R to C. The greatest believer is missing, of course. Huh? Greatest believer is just watching Duke play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You so, should have been here. So this is the next quantum jump in mathematical imagination. It's a tremendous, it's an incredible work of enor enormous imagination. Yes. Well, it Forget about the problem he solved. Forget about the problem he solved. He decides that it makes sense to think of geometry over the complex numbers. And now it sounds obvious. But at the time, it was totally revolutionary. You could do analysis over the complex numbers, I mean, algebra over the complex numbers. But geometry over the complex numbers, where the one dimensional things were. Even the one dimensional things were hard to see. You, know? you, have, you have these things that don't really intersect each other, but they look like they do. It. And it's a tremendous. The concept of Riemann surface appears here, and as a bright jump, it has the next quantum jump going from the real numbers to complex numbers. Notice that we here lose the order. Or, 
oh, this is an order field. This is not an order field. This algebraic incomplete, on the other hand. And so we have this very uh, dramatic uh, the theory of enormous beauty of coherence, I say here. It's a theory of enormous beauty of coherence. Uh, uh, in fact, as you know, in mathematics, uh, uh, get most or a great axis of the de development of mathematics has been uh, the attempt to solve more and more equations, more and more general equations, uh, uh, algebraic equations, the Fantine equations, differential equations. In any case, in, in the case of algebraic equations, well, uh, if you are doing the linear equation, you'll never get out of the real numbers. If you're doing the quadratic equation, you get the complex numbers and so on and so forth. Uh, but if you are doing uh, many linear equations on many variables, uh, and I say from this perspective, just at the complex numbers, which need two real components, appear motivated by the solution of the general quadratic equation. The introduction of square matrices already appear in the classical Chinese texts. The nine chapters of the mathematical art Well, I don't know how to spell it, this dash, because the Chinese characters. So, uh, and this is, the, this is very hard today, because it is, it's, a, it's a book, there is a Wikipedia-like, multi-century, multi continental-wide collaboration work with no one author. Uh, it's a wiki work. Uh, and this goes from the 10th uh, to the 2nd century, 2nd century BC. So this well, goes from the 10th. Uh, this paper by anyone in German or in Latin? In German, no. Then it's K, I'll see. Uh, probably. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, but it's true. So. Probably, yeah. <laughs> I'm not so sure, maybe in Latin, you're right, because well, it's, no, no, but then, the, the, this is the correct It starts in the German, but I mean, uh, yeah. it's better from that, of course. I have to check the correct spelling, but it seems also the spelling has evolved, so I'm not so sure. I'm very confused about that topic, but it seems to be a correct spelling. I was very careful about this. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, in the nine chapters of the mathematical art, 10th to 2nd century BC, all these algorithms for you know, the determinants and all these are developed. Uh, and uh, in the first place where matrix is written like we know it, and, but really not quite, not quite matrix multiplication. Yes, determinants, that kind of thing, but not quite matrix multiplication. Um, so, well, masterpiece of mathematics in any case. Uh, but we track back a little bit to 1850. Uh, and then J.J. Silvester. Uh, has so this. this is the paper with better numbers? Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. No, but maybe it's after, but yeah. the idea maybe. Not yet, no, he has something later where he does some discourse that divide. This is very early, the, the introduction of Riemann surface. The introduction of the concept of Riemann surface. So complex over the complex, the geometry over the complex and complex manifold. Uh, and uh, 1850, J.J. Sylvester uh, develops all these works where matrix multiplication appears. Matrix multiplication. So finally, matrix multiplication makes the appearance, uh, and uh, in the and then this allows in 1858, well, a little bit later, uh, a, a masterpiece, a memoir on the theory of matrices. Uh, 
so Sylvester invents the word, invents the word matrix, or it's KB, who fully understands that this is a ring, that this is matrix multiplication, and that matrix multiplication is non commutative. And it's the first time that non commutativity appears in mathematics. So this is in 1858. Finally, non commutativity is revealed to not in others and uh, the lower world. Well, uh, these are groups, and uh, this is not really groups, this is algebras. Uh, uh, Kao multiplications that, or mutations and that kind of thing, this combinatorial game. But this is algebra. Uh, uh, also, I, uh, and the origin is very different. The influence may be there, but it's not obvious to them at all that uh, even just the concept of the unitary group takes a long time to develop from here. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, this is where this matrix, the world of matrix and non commutative algebras, is the first time that it appears, you know. Ide already ideas. Uh, very primitive ideas from representation theory, from permutation groups, and this kind of thing. Very primitive ideas from representation theory. It's very hard to trace back all these things, of course. So is he still in Cambridge or is he in Johns Hopkins? This is Cambridge. This is Cambridge, I think. And uh, Angel Fand used to say that this is the natural evolution uh, from real numbers, complex numbers, and he would call the matrices non-commutative numbers. So the matrices were the very reasonable next, this is one component, two components, even just matrices two by two, is four components and is the first instance of non-commutative numbers. So for example, it was the very natural process of evolution. Uh, to this point. Uh, uh, and notice though that, of course, that uh, classical mechanics is what is motivating the car. Even before cla even before classical mechanics. I mean they are trying to develop classical mechanics, they have ideas of classical mechanics. And, and uh, electromagnetism, we would call it now, is what is motivating Riemann to go into the complex numbers, really electromagnetism. And of course, quantum mechanics, mechanics will motivate non commutative algebra, like geometry. But let me, I'm getting ahead of myself, let me try to explain a little bit what I mean by this, and then I have to go to the fateful year of 1925. And uh, so now I have to go to the fateful year of 1925, and we are going to get to to go and zoom in to the day that exactly the June 7th, 1925. So, this is the day. June 7th, 1925. There is this guy, very young guy, this youngster, I should say, on top of a rock. And he is feverish. Insanity that he's scared. Because the previous night, the, the much thinking, he was learning by heart, Gethe, and hiking, learning by heart, all these verses by Gethe. And then he, he got too overactive, and he does this calculation all night. And he, has, he knows he has it. He's going insane and he goes to the rock sweating with fear at his own discovery. And this guy is called, called Werner Heisenberg. 
And this night he is recorded in history, of course. And in the night he proposed that a non commutative value of observables would explain quantum phenomena. He didn't know the existence of matrices. Uh, physicists were a little bit behind the game, and even complex numbers were not very familiar. Uh, and then he just writes letters and says, this letter doesn't connect with this letter, blah, blah, blah. And of course, the calculation is very complicated. He doesn't have a good answer. He doesn't have uh, Max Born's computation relations. He doesn't have any like this. He, he, he writes this very dirty paper, but he's scared. Do you think he's going to say, what, is, what am I saying? I'm saying that the variables are not coming from I get the quantum phenomena out of this one hypothesis. Just out of one hypothesis that space, momentum, and position do not commute, then I get. non commutative of observables. So, just one hypothesis, non commutativity, one hypothesis gives you the quantum phenomena. So, what is going on? So, he is very, very, he's kind of in this uh, in, in moment of insanity. He feels it's just so weird. You know? Also, he didn't sleep, he just wrote things, you know, he got the calculation to work out, he doesn't know what he's saying. Uh, and so I say, after a sleepless night of calculation, he was so deeply shaken by the result that he left the house and awaited the sunrise on top of a rock. So, Giotte is the right thing, especially Dr. Faust. That's right, Dr. Faust. <laughs> he is very shaken by the analogy, of course. And uh, 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 I think rapidly wrote a paper using this insight, but afraid of its own originality. He feared first as Max Born to do that. And he was a father, you know, he was a guy that knew what he was doing, he was good, you know, he's not reasonably tied, and was a, a much better mathematician than most of the guys, and very profound thinker, very good physicist, all in one, you know, kind of guy you go and ask this, did I go insane? You know? And uh, Born was an old world. It didn't take long for Born to realize that he could make sense of it in the language of matrices. Call Jordan to make it possible and to make it more palatable to the general public. So the physicists were going to say, well, what are you talking about? We write matrices, or at least there are papers and things and things written in terms of matrices. So it's kind of a step backwards going to coordinate rather than staying in the non community budget. But it's something they want to do to, so that people read the paper, don't think you are just going insane, you know, that kind of thing. You know? So they go to matrices, win the Nobel Prize. Jordan didn't, but for obvious reasons, Nazi. <laughs> but anyway, Jordan, the three wrote the papers. Jordan was born in Heisenberg, this is Heisenberg's idea, born uh -huh. So it's your Jordan did the mathematics. Jordan. Jordan did the mathematics and he had no prize, which is not Nazi guys. <laughs> anyway. But Heisenberg, in a way, was too. Huh? Yeah, Heisenberg, in a way. Well, was... and that's very debated. Debated <laughs> and not, not as clear. Jordan <laughs> really. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Jordan, Japan. In any case, they write the papers, 1925, two Nobel Prizes. Uh, but Nobel Prize is a small thing for this, I mean, small pitch for this kind of monumental revolution in science. Uh, Nobel Prize is lucky to have the guys accept it. Uh, uh, and uh, now I'm going to uh, to explain how you would obtain Heisenberg's conclusion uh, more, very much a posteriori. You know, I, I'm going to cheat. It's 
much more. What I'm going to do is too clean. It's not the way it has to be. Did it, you know, you just intuit the thing, did the dirty thing, it was chaotic, took a long time to clean. I'll do the clean thing, okay? Well, it's debatable. Was this, did they receive the Nobel Prize because of this? Well, because of this paper? No, no, but how are they discovered this because of the Nobel Prize? Is this because of this? No. Oh, come on, it had a huge effect on the development of physics. There have been no other, there has been no other period of time where there has, has been such a progress in physics. Possibly, but they, they really, I think Heisenberg was too young to worry about that. He was up in his 20s. Uh, he really wanted uh, to discover a fundamental law of physics, and he did. He really wanted to discover a fundamental law of physics, in my opinion, but it's hard to tell. The motivation, you know? uh, I think it was bigger than the Nobel Prize for all of them. Uh, it was really huge. I mean, they knew they were, they had something absolutely huge in their hands. Yeah, that's true. Hands, you know? They knew they had something absolutely huge in their hands. Uh, uh, so, how would you get to non commutative variables from the experimental evidence at the end of the 19th century? Uh, well, what was the new experimental events at the end of the 19th century? Uh, well, uh, it has to do with something in the realm of the very small, of course. Uh, and the evidence came from spectrometry. By hitting a tube filled with a certain chemical element and decomposing the light it emits, perhaps by using a person some mechanism of the sort into its uh, various frequencies, we obtain a delta number of lines of light that is convenient to index by their wavelengths. Such so data, the list of wavelengths, collection of numbers, is what we know as an atomic spectrum. For example, for the hydrogen atom, by performing such an experiment, we get the following order setting that we in the real life. So it is a spectrum, and notice that it's surprisingly rational numbers. And L, well, is 36 times 4, 5, 6 times 10 to the minus 8 meters, the wavelength. Take this basic wavelength, so you have 9 fifths of L, 16 twelfths of L. This is the experiment, we just measure the thing 25 over 21 of L, and 36 over 22 of L. Uh, and so, uh, well, after you think a little bit, you know, the physicists are very good at this thing called thinking, they uh, write it like this. And that's what you got, that's what you got. n squared over n squared minus 4. Uh, and, uh, and so, well, that's that. Uh, you were able to do that experiment, you got the Nobel Prize too, by the way. Uh, and that's real physics. <laughs> and, but, but if you do that one, you also do this one. Uh, actually, you realize that. For slightly more complicated atoms, uh, so you get a finite set of numbers, finite set of numbers, then you get a fixed number that depends on the atom. And then this is L is universal. That's the move the Planck. But we didn't know Planck anyway, you know. So L is universal. Four over L is forget R. So you get that one over L, lambda is this subtraction of the squares for a fixed finite number of n's. And so what is these numbers? You know, what does it have to do? 
one competitive market. You know, well, now you, but you know matrices, so you know the answer. But they didn't, so they didn't know the answer. It's so easy to tell the answer after you know the answer, right? and so hard to unsee the answer once you know the answer. It's impossible to imagine what it feels not to know the answer. But even try to imagine not knowing the answer. Uh, so, this is a uh, in 1890. Nobel Prize, Rydberg, uh, the Rydberg Rig, and then, then they continue. Uh, now, these experimental results, if you are a very good mathematical physicist at the time, then you realize that this makes no sense. Because you make a classical mechanics model of, uh, of thingies moving there, even if you believe Boltzmann, you, know, you make a classical statistical model, uh, statistical mechanics, classical mechanics model of something, you know, gas moving things, things emitting energy. Uh, uh, well, uh, technically, it's an exercise in mathematical physics for the second and first year graduate students to prove that Newtonian mechanics coupled with Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. These two theories. You believe the Maxwell equations and Newton's equations. Lagrange, uh, Hamilton Lagrange, Hamiltonian mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, and Maxwell's uh, mechanics. Equations for electromagnetism. Uh, and then you can prove that the spectrum the, of emission of any element has to be an R, R. an abelian subgroup of R, and this is not an abelian subgroup of R, it's a finite subgroup. Uh, so this makes no sense. This cannot possibly be true, but it's what you see. You can prove, if you believe Maxwell equations and Newton's equations, that it should be a group here. And what you get is that even for more complicated atoms, sometimes it's also, sometimes it's also true. Let me tell you what is true in general. And, it, and this is Nobel Prize, Ritz Rydberg combination principle. Let me tell you what it is. So the price is later than later. Yeah, but they got it later, of course. Okay. Probably. Anyway, it is Rich Rydberg. They were top experimentalists at the time. And they show the following. Now you change conveniently variables. And first you just change the variables. And then uh, you will call it frequency but not then, it's just a change of variable. Now you call it the frequency of the wave, but then it was just the inverse of the length. Do you believe that light is waves? That's okay. Wave, it's satisfying the wave equation as a consequence of Maxwell equations, that's okay. So that's the frequency of the electromagnetic wave. And they, sh they for, for complicated atoms, they show something very weird. That there exists a discrete set or, if you want to say, uh, a discrete set of numbers whose differences give you all the frequencies. And then something else is true. Truth, you want, you want the addition of frequencies to be a frequency from the wave equation. You want that. But you only get it sometimes. You only get it when j is equal j. You, it, it falls if j is not equal to j, but if you put this, there is these mysterious numbers that are not frequencies of anything you observe. That when you get these differences, you get the, the actual frequencies you observe. And you and it, the combination formula says that if the index is the same, you can understand, and it's a frequency that you observe. 
So this is almost an abelian subgroup, but not. So what's going on? The group appears very much of some kind of different algebra degradation in that stuff. Well, uh, we'll see in a second. We'll see in a second. Um, so what's going on? What's going on? Uh, how would you would you uh, get out of this monumental puzzle? You know. How do you get out of this puzzle? Uh, well. Let me define an algebraic structure. And this algebraic structure occurs on i cross i, that is the set of pairs i comma j. And then there is two maps, the so-called source map. the so-called target map, another map, and, uh, and then you get something that is this mysterious set of frequencies, or just the indices, just this abstract set of indices, the cross product of the set of indices with the set of Cartesian product, and these two source and target maps. And they form a, a, a category. They form a group of a category. So these are the arrows of the category. So I'm guessing your this is your interpretation of it's interesting. So yeah, it's my explanation. These guys would never. No, they know. They, 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 the category were not defined by them. That's why I said I'm cleaning the story. It's not the way it appears in Heisenberg. So anyway, the, the arrow ij goes from i to j to the object i to the object j. And uh, and the composition of arrows is very simple. The arrow jk composes with the arrow ij if and only jj. Lk is a, and then it gives you the arrow ik. It's an e as easy a category as you can possibly imagine. Uh, it's a very, it's, it's very simple category. Uh, and so uh, it has identities on the left, for example. And identities on the right, for example. And it's associative, so it's what we call this structure, it's called a category. So, uh, actually, it's a little bit more than a category. It's a groupoid in that every arrow has an inverse. Every arrow has an inverse, and you compose, and then you get an identity arrow. Okay. All these are identity arrows, all these ii's and the j's are identity arrows. And so uh, every arrow has an image, so it's a group point. So, well, uh, when it turns out that, uh, I will explain in general what is the convolution algebra of a group point. But the convolution algebra of the group point is just the matrix algebra. And these are observables in the modular stack of the group point, the stratification of the group point. And what you are saying is that the observable world of this quantum system is a stack that whose algebra functions is a matrix algebra, is non commutative So in fact, uh, for a, one single atom in quantum mechanics is a zero dimension of the stack. This is a very interesting fact. It's already very interesting. Just the symmetries. Of the, of the of the atom 
give you the read the rate discrimination formula. Yeah. But I can do it in this categorical framework. Okay. So, uh, stacks have this uh, algebra of functions that are non commuted. And what, uh, and what Heisenberg observed is that the world behaved like uh, the space, the, the, the space time of the quantum in the very small, at the very small uh, level behave uh, stacky with, and, the and the algebra of observ observables in quantum systems were non commutative algebras. So, uh, well, this recover the Ritzberg Rick combination principle, you know, it just this high, the Heisenberg one assumption, coordinates are non commutative can be thought of as saying that we are in, in a very particular legal stack, a local stack that contains the local coordinates of the system. Uh, so, um, well, the next thing that I uh, was meant to explain, but of course time is passing, I don't want to torture Uncle Sberry <laughs> think much too much. Just let me say one, two words with, the, with respect to this, but everything's here on my, on my paper called Non-Commutative Geometry Indomitable. That's what it's called, Non-Commutative Geometry Indomitable. Uh, and uh, here uh, I explain very thoroughly why uh, groupons Give non commutative algebras. And, uh, and they generalize Gelfand's duality. Gelfand's duality tells you that algebras, uh, well, there's another level here. Algebras. You also have commutative algebra that are part of non commutative algebras uh, are the same thing as spaces. Manifold space is just a space, it's an algebra. This is Gelfand's duality. And uh, then spaces. Uh, are particular kinds of groupoids. When they are commutative, so to speak, these are spaces and commutative algebras. But when they are non-commutative, the multiplication of the algebras on commute, they become groupoids or stacks. They, group, they, they become groupoids or the same thing, that is the same thing to say as stacks. And so, uh, well, you have a way to go from groupoids to non commutative algebras, and this is very well done in mathematics. It is, a, it is a, a called the convolution algebra. So, uh, you know, if you have functions, uh, you can produce the convolution algebra, you know, with the star multiplication. And uh, when these functions are functions on the real line, again, you are in this situation, and then you end up with just the Fourier transform, and then you are talking about two commutative algebras related by Fourier transform. But when you have symmetries, and this, the whole thing of this story is that there were lock, secret local symmetries that Heisenberg detected. And when you have symmetries, a group is an example of both a space and a group point. And when you have a group, a Fourier analysis on a group, Fourier analysis on a group, now it's a very delicate matter because the algebra that we're obtaining is a non-commutative algebra on the convolution property. Well, 
do the, doing the convolution algebra uh, gives you non-commutative algebras. They, they tend to be sister algebras. Or uh, all, all the classification of fundamental Neumann algebras, type 1 to 1, 3, depending on how complicated are the, the, the lo, global symmetries. But global, local symmetries will never give you type 3 von Neumann algebras. But global symmetries will give you type 3 von Neumann algebras. And uh, well, you, you get this situation. You get algebras, non commutative algebras. They can be thought of always, more or less, as operator algebras on Hilbert space. That is to say, as matrices. Uh, so they can always thought of, be thought of, and so physicists usually work on coordinates as operator algebras. But you could work of them not representing them as matrices, just thinking of them as algebras. This has been the approach in algebraic geometry, greatly developed by uh, the collaborators and uh, the Hobbesian, I think, and uh, where you don't need to represent them explicitly as algebras of operators or Hilbert spaces, but you can think of them as algebraic objects themselves. And uh, well, many other things, uh, but I, I guess that's more or less. Uh, but this is explained more carefully in the publication. And I just want to congratulate uh, Steve again, who is him a very happy person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.